parliamentlive.tv. parliamentlive.tv 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 parliamentlive.tv
parliamentlive.tv. parliamentlive.tv 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 parliamentlive.tv
parliamentlive.tv. parliamentlive.tv 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 parliamentlive.tv
parliamentlive.tv. parliamentlive.tv 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 parliamentlive.tv
parliamentlive.tv. The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding will Uh, we abandoned that in the, uh, you know, when the end of history was declared. But the reality is that the Russians didn't abandon their disinformation and misinformation. And we've been working with the Americans to release intelligence. So we released the attempt to install a puppet regime in Kiev. Uh, we released information about various false flag operations. And I think that's been absolutely critical in Ron footing the Russians ahead of the invasion because they haven't been able to declare the false pretext that they wanted to do. They haven't been able to use the element of surprise because the United Kingdom and the United States in particular were making it very clear to the world what their plans were. So what I would say, Tom, is that we have actively pursued a more proactive policy in the face of immediate Russian threat. Can we but, pick up on some of the points you've just made? Yeah. Um, because you, you quite rightly said that um, you've met with many, uh, not just partners, but also uh, Sergei Lavrov uh, in the OET. Can you think why it is that he continued despite the threats that you very clearly made? I met uh, Th Sergei Lavrov three times. Mm. So I met him at the UN General Assembly, I met him in Stockholm, and I met him again in Moscow. And at each opportunity, the United Kingdom has been very clear, first of all, that we know what Russia is planning. You know, that despite their claims that there wouldn't be an invasion, we had very clear intelligence that that's exactly what they're planning. And that we want to remove the element of surprise, we want to call out the playbook that they were using. Secondly, I made it very clear that there would be a united response, not just from Britain, but also from the G7 and there would be severe sanctions. And the third thing I made very clear is the Ukrainians will fight. Now, you, you chairman, asked me why didn't the Russians take this seriously? Well, first of all, they underestimated the unity of the West. I think what we've seen since is they've been surprised by the severity of the sanctions, the unity, not just of the G7, but also countries like Singapore, South Korea, Australia have also joined the sanctions, so have Switzerland. 
And I think they have also not believed the Ukrainians would fight. You know, I think they, the, the Russians have been very, very surprised. And you know, we can speculate as to the reasons of that. You know, is it Putin's relative isolation within the Russian system? Is it the fact that information hasn't been fed up to him properly? And we saw the National Security Council and the extent to which people in the Russian system were able to speak directly uh, to President Putin. So we can speculate about the reasons, but there has been a serious underestimation and a massive strategic mistake in Putin pursuing those policies. And we did all we could to warn in advance. We did all we could. Is part of this because Lavrov isn't part of the security circle that surrounds Putin? He's not part of the St. Petersburg grouping? He's part of the Moscow foreign policy set that doesn't have much influence anymore? Well, that, that could well be true. But the Defence Secretary also delivered those messages to his counterpart. The National Security Advisor delivered messages to his counterpart. You know, many, many leaders have had direct meetings with Putin where they've delivered these messages. So we can speculate about why it was that Putin has made this strategic mistake and ended up cornered, essentially. But I felt our role as the United Kingdom was to do all we could in, adv in advance to deter a Russian invasion. In recent weeks, uh, sorry, in recent months, many of us have spoken about networks of democracies and the, the Prime Minister uh, expanded the G7 to uh, a sort of a D10 uh, in Carbis Bay in Cornwall. You've spoken about a network of liberty. Do you think that the events of the recent weeks give encouragement to that? I think it demonstrates the vital importance of working with our allies, including non-democracies, because every country that is a sovereign nation that believes in a rules-based system doesn't want to live in a world where a country can be invaded just because another country declares it's not a real country. So I think it is very important for us to build that very strong network with the G7. I think we can do more to strengthen the G7, give it a more permanent footing. You know, the G7 has been instrumental in coordinating sanctions in this crisis, but I would like to see it on a more permanent a footing, like a secretariat, having that infrastructure, the type of infrastructure that NATO has, other organizations have, uh, I think would be good. I want to see it broadened. And you know, there are 141 countries that voted against Russia at the UN General Assembly. You know, we should be getting all of those countries to put sanctions on Russia. So there's an opportunity to build a wider network. And then separately for the United Kingdom, we have been active you know, with AUKUS, uh, in deepening relationships with the Gulf, in deepening relationships with India. All of these deeper economic and security relationships are vitally important to pull countries into the orbit of rules-based, sovereign, freedom-loving nations and away from the orbit of authoritarian regimes, namely Russia, but also China. You, I mean, one country that you mentioned there, which is, as you know, very important to the United Kingdom and one that this committee is focused on a lot, is India, of course. And I, I know your uh, colleague uh, sitting on your left uh, comes from, uh, has formerly, ser formerly served in Pakistan, but perhaps you give us a slight perspective on why you think that India didn't sign or didn't vote alongside the other 141. Well, I have spoken to um, my counterpart, uh, Minister Jai Shankar, uh, and encouraged India to stand against Russia and made it very clear that we see this as a violation of sovereignty, that every country that believes in freedom and democracy should absolutely abhor. I think the issue for India is there is some level of dependence on Russia, uh, both in terms of its defence relationships, but also in terms of its economic relationships. And I think the way forward is for a closer economic and defence relationship with India, both by the United Kingdom, but also by our like-minded allies. And that's one thing. I've already been to India as Foreign Secretary. Uh, we are working on those closer security links. We've done joint exercises, for example. We had the carrier strike group uh, operating uh, with India. 
We're looking at areas like security. We're now negotiating a trade agreement. But this is the way that we are going to bring India closer into a circle of countries that support freedom, democracy and sovereignty. Thank you. I'm going to bring in two very short interventions. Bob, you wanted... Can I just follow up, uh, Tom, just what you were saying about deterrence? I'm just wondering if you, if you have a, a considered opinion why deterrence failed, because Putin declared in 2007 he didn't like the post-Cold War order anymore. The following year, the Georgian War, 2014, the first Ukrainian war, in order to prevent those countries from physically being able to enter NATO. Was it the German dependency on gas? Was it our dependency on or our liking for Russian money? Why do you think deterrence failed? I think post-Cold War, the West took its eye off the ball. You know, defence budgets were cut. Uh, there was too much uh, entering into trade and economic relationships without understanding the underlying strategic dependency that that would lead to. So that's particularly true of hydrocarbons, which are, of course, a major part of the Russian economy. But it's also true of technology exports. So we enabled and I, I don't just mean Britain, I mean the wider West enabled the development of uh, Russian you know, high-tech warfare. Uh, we essentially provided the funding uh, through oil and gas and everything from financial services to uh, broader parts of the service economy you know, were integrated with Russia despite the fact that you know, we saw what happened in 2008, we saw what happened in 2014. You know, the Munich Security Conference in 2007, Putin made it pretty clear what his intentions were. So there's no doubt that the West didn't act early enough or more decisively enough. The reality is that President Putin did not take the threats of deterrence seriously enough. What are we going to do now, do you think? Well, what we have to do now is we have to strengthen NATO. We particularly have to strengthen the eastern flank. We've already deployed more troops into Estonia, but there is more to do. You know, we have to be serious about defence spending right across NATO. I'm very pleased that Germany have reversed their position on supplying defensive weaponry into Ukraine, but also on the defence <coughs> budget and the energy budget. And all of the free, free world need to rethink their economic dependence. And we've already started working on that with China. For example, disconnection of Huawei, reducing strategic dependency on China. But that is what we need to do with Russia. Hydrocarbons is the big, biggest example. But more broadly, you know, our economic policy needs to be seen much more through the light of geopolitics. So you're making the argument for increased defence spending now? I in do the, support... In the UK? Well, I am pleased that we've already increased our defence budget and are spending more on defence. I'm not going to preempt the decisions of the Defence Secretary and the Chancellor uh, at this meeting of You're the Foreign the Affairs case. Committee, but I am making the point that over the last 15 years, it is clear that NATO has not done enough. And that's not just in terms of spending, it's also in terms of technological development. It's also in terms of the security architecture. And what Russia has done has shattered the security architecture of Europe. And it's not just shattered the security tech architecture of Europe. It's sent shockwaves around the world. And this is why South Korea are applying sanctions on Russia and why Japan are applying sanctions on Russia. Because if we don't stop Putin and Ukraine, of course, it's devastating for European security but it also sends a signal to aggressors elsewhere around the world. Thank you. Alicia. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for yes. coming before us. You, you just looked at how in the last 15 years we failed to do enough. <laughs> Looking at the last six months, you said that we need to do as much as possible. Um, and it seems like our intelligence was so solid and certain invasion was coming. And indeed, when we were in Ukraine, our Five Eyes intelligence partners and Baltic uh, intelligence partners told us there'd be an invasion within four weeks. It was six weeks, but close enough. Did we consider at any point with our allies a preemptive or proactive measure, for example, putting in place a no-fly zone first, given that we were so certain this invasion was coming, 
Were there any discussions about doing something proactively and preemptively to stop Putin before he crossed the border? The proactive thing that we were doing was supplying defensive weapons to Ukraine. And we were the first European country to do that. It was quite controversial at the time. Others didn't necessarily want to follow. We're now seeing a much wider range of countries giving defensive weapons to Ukraine. So we led, we led the way on that. Yeah. Uh, the issue with the no-fly zone is that Ukraine is not part of NATO. No, it's not. And it's a difference. There is a difference between us helping Ukraine in their self-defense under the UN Charter and actively becoming involved. The and, and that is the difference. So we were pushing very hard with our allies for more defensive support into Ukraine. You know, what's our overall strategy to ensure Putin loses in Ukraine? And of course, we tried to deter him by, by, by being public about this. But the first part of the strategy is supporting Ukraine economically. So we had the Ukraine UK for, forum. Uh, Dmitry Kaliba came over to London. Uh, we were supplying support for the Navy. Uh, we pr supplied UKF support for energy, you know, strengthening Ukraine economically, but also making sure they had the defensive weapons they need. And in fact, we started this in 2015, yeah. Operation Orbital training up the soldiers so if, and if so I on. May, the, second between... part, the second part that we agreed on in, in internationally was the sanctions package. So by December at the G7, the G7 foreign ministers had agreed there would be severe sanctions. And we were very clear in our messaging to Moscow that would be severe sanctions. I think there's a question about how seriously they took that and why they didn't take it seriously, but we were very clear with the messaging. The third part of the strategy is isolating Russia in the international community. And part of the way of doing that was calling out what they were doing in advance of the invasion. So we'd be much more active in disseminating information, releasing intelligence to show, uh, to show the Russian playbook. Uh, forgive me, there's, there's a difference though between bolstering and calling out. Was there any meaningful discussion about, and it didn't need to be within a NATO context, it could have been bilateral between the UK and our uh, Baltic and Eastern European partners, it could have been with the US, between actually doing something on the ground that would prevent that action? Because it seemed like the Defence Secretary was very clear from as far back as October that we wouldn't be going in, despite the fact that we signed a treaty with the Ukrainians saying we would protect them it would this ever happen. I, I think it's absolutely fair to say that at NATO, we are very clear about the Article 5 responsibility we have towards fellow NATO allies and how that is different from the situation in Ukraine. <clears throat> we were the most forward-leaning in Europe on supplying defensive weapons to Ukraine. Others were, you know, have taken time. I mean, most, most countries are now supplying those defensive weapons. But you know, to, to what you're saying, Alicia, given that they weren't even in the space of defying, supplying defensive weapons to Ukraine, we were not going to end up in the space where they wanted active intervention. And there are all kinds of issues with active intervention, which would bring NATO in direct conflict with Russia, which is a escalation. <laughs> but certainly the discussions we were having were around sanctions, economic dependency, and they are around supplying support to Ukraine, because that's what we were able to do at the time. Andrew. Uh, Foreign Secretary, you, you spoke about strengthening NATO uh, and also alluded to the importance of spending more on defence, which I think is vitally important. But we have, in the United Kingdom, played our part for many years. Others have not done so. Others have not been spending the same level on defence that we have been doing. Mm. And other countries in Europe have failed to join NATO, yet it is really their duty to be part of NATO. And I think of Sweden, Austria, I think of the Republic of Ireland. Isn't it time that we urge them to play their part as well and join the NATO family? Well, there are quite a few countries that want to join NATO that haven't been able to. And it is a decision for NATO members. I think what, what has happened as a result of this crisis, which has been a huge wake-up call for Europe, is that countries are changing their entire energy policy, their entire defence policy, their entire sanctions policy 
as a result of this. And we do need to relook at European security architecture. It needs to be tougher, it needs to be stronger, there needs to be much stronger support on the eastern flank. And everybody in NATO and beyond has to play their part in it. Of course, we've got the GEF arrangements uh, with the Nordic states. Uh, that is very positive and very much welcomed uh, by Sweden and Finland and others. But we, we need to do more. And you know, to the chairman's question originally on our foreign policy, I was very clear about the objectives of the Network of Liberty, which was developing closer security partnerships, closer economic partnerships with countries around the world to help create uh, better, secure, better economic and better defensive security in the long term. The, right. the issue is now we have an immediate crisis because we didn't do enough. And I'm not just talking about Britain, I'm talking collectively we haven't done enough for the past 20 years. Can I bring you back then to the network point that you make? Because one of the great strengths that the UK advertises, and quite rightly, is the network building effect that the Foreign Office has or has had over several generations. Do you think the 5% real terms cut in FCDO spending from 2019-20 through to 4-5, 24-25, will help that network building or hinder it? On the, on the subject of foreign office budget and resources. I would always like more budget and resources. We one of the thing, one of the thing that pains me more than anything is the fact that over the years we've sold off some of our embassy buildings. I think that's a huge mistake and I certainly don't want to see uh, any more of that happen. And I always want to make sure that we have enough diplomats out in the field and here in London. I'm sure the Permanent Secretary will say more about this, but we are protecting the number of people in our organisation. We're not cutting the number of staff. What we are doing is we're redeploying staff into key geostrategic areas. Right, I, so I, we're I, having more people working on economic security, more people working on uh, information and particularly disinformation, and we're having more people working in areas like um, technology and fighting the technology battle. I appreciate Sorry. your point, uh, mm. Foreign Secretary. I'm sure when you were Chief Secretary to the Treasury, you argued against every, every embassy sale. I did. I'm glad I did. to hear it. Not, I absolutely did. I'm not even smart. My, my boss at the time, Philip Hammond, didn't, didn't necessarily agree with me. Well, that's... I can tell you, me and the then Foreign Secretary discussed it frequently, and I was always on his side. Can there the we go. Um, I will be delighted to see the letters that, uh, that you're going to publish on the back of that because it will be fascinating to see the account of various different embassy sales. Um, can, we, can we focus, though, on, on this question of spending? Because it's not just uh, a question of not reducing the number of personnel. We've opted out of, of the European Union, and that means we've got to invest more in bilateral relationships. So that's not a head that's not headcount neutral, that's actually an increase. We've got significantly greater interests in many parts of the world, as advertised by a former foreign secretary in embassies, including Chad. That's another increase. Where are we cutting back on the influence that we've sought to have in order to increase these posts? Or are we simply trying to uh, skin the cat a little thinner? We're not, we're not reducing our staff numbers. What we are doing is redeploying staff. No, I hear that, but we're, we're increasing areas. our number of posts. So we're either having fewer people in more posts, in which case we're having less effect in the posts that we've already got, or we need to be increasing the number of staff. Staying staff neutral doesn't really help. Um, I think Philip wanted to come in on that. So, Chair, as the Foreign Secretary has said, we're maintaining the overall numbers in the organisation. And in terms of expanding our global network, we've opened about 10 new posts. They're actually mostly quite small, and so we can do that by, by kind of rearranging them, including some of the headquarters staff becoming deployed overseas. So it's not that we're moving people around one bit of the network and denuding it to staff another bit of the network. We're maintaining rough stability across, across the network. We are looking at making sure that in, in the headquarters, A, that the efficiencies we can drive out from some of the merger activity where we had duplicate functions, and B, making sure that what we are doing is is against the foreign section, the government's latest priorities, is where we've got our, got our people. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's worth also saying, Chairman, that we are currently working on our workforce plan 
for next year. So we are in the throes of finalising the workforce plan and finalising the development budget for 2022-2023. So I will be able to give you more detail on exactly where people are deployed quite soon, but we're not yet at the final point of those discussions. Okay, can we come straight back to the Ukraine question? Because clearly uh, one area where there's going to be enormous pressure on your resources in coming days and weeks is the support needed to countries like Poland, Hungary, Romania and so on, who are dealing with migrant numbers, the like of which we haven't seen since 1945 uh, in Europe. This is, this is pretty striking. Can you tell us what support the UK is giving to those people in those areas and, and to the countries that are reliant on, uh, that, that could do with assistance from us? We, we um, a couple of weeks ago, sent out forward deployment teams to the borders uh, in Slovakia, in Poland. We've sent out humanitarian teams as well uh, to support the Poles. And we're one of the largest donators of aid already. Uh, so I think we've donated uh, 294 million in aid, of which 120 is humanitarian, 100 million on the energy sector, and 74 million of fiscal support. Uh, it's also worth saying that the DEC Ukraine appeal uh, that we launched jointly with DEC has already reached £100 million. Pounds. It's probably one of the quickest uh, raising of funding. Uh, so we've also, I mentioned Poland and Slovakia, but we've also deployed teams to Hungary, uh, Romania and Moldova. And we've readied more than a thousand British troops uh, to provide further humanitarian support. And in fact, uh, the PM is going to be announcing more humanitarian support later this afternoon. So we really are at the forefront of providing support. We're also providing consular support uh, in all of those uh, locations as well. You will be aware that other humanitarian groups are operating. What support are we able to give uh, to ensure that people like the ICRC are able to have the access that they need in Ukraine and offer the support they need to the civilian population? We are doing all we can to push for humanitarian corridors. The issue has been the lack of military to military conversations. So these humanitarian corridors have not necessarily uh, been protected uh, in the way that we, we would want. Some of those teams have been able to access Ukraine and we are providing uh, aid to them. I don't know, Tom, if you want to say a bit more about that. And that's right. And also when you were in, in, your, in your trip to Geneva, I mean, it was very much uh, focus of all of that. Um, and some of the funds we've talked about dispersed have been through through the ICRC and others. So, so um, absolutely right. Alicia, do you want to come in on this? It's just the point on humanitarian on. access. Uh, in our sanctions regime, which is absolutely welcome, uh, there is an issue in which there's no opt-out specifically for humanitarian organisations like UN 2615 that was agreed in Afghanistan. Uh, the US have passed legislation in January to make sure that our sanctions regime allows any humanitarian actor to deal with any actor that's been sanctioned, no matter how distasteful. So will we be putting in place the same opt-out for our sanctions regime? I mean, in, in, in short, yes. I mean, I don't know the same, same opt-out, but actually it's a, you know, the, the, we are making sure that actually on the back of our sanctions regime, we don't end up uh, impacting on the humanitarian work we're going to do. It won't be exactly the same as the, as, the U, as the US system. And one of the sort of tensions is you want to get a sanctions regime through as, as quickly as possible. You can't, so, you know, that, that's the tension we're trying to do. So you get through a sanctions regime and then you can work out general, general carve-outs. So there will be a carve-out coming specifically to protect them because they don't feel they have that protection at the moment. Specifically how we're going to do that, I'm afraid. We can get back to you on that. That'd be great. That. You write to us on that. Sure. Yeah. Um, Forest Secretary, there's, the UK not only leads in terms of uh, our own donations, but in terms of influencing others, I hope, to support. And the UN is saying that only about 5% of its uh, 1.1 billion that it's asked for uh, to support in Ukraine has been so far achieved. What are we doing to help them? We gap. helped. I met the UN when I was in uh, Geneva last week. We helped with their flash appeal. We will be doing more work to galvanise humanitarian support over the next few days. And in fact, that is what the Prime Minister is discussing at the moment with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and uh, also Ritter as well from uh, the Netherlands. Thank you. Chris. Um, how many additional visas have been given to uh, uh, Ukrainians since the invasion began by the UK? Uh, I, don't, I don't have the figure, but I think the, it's Home, 50. Yeah, the Home Secretary it's 50. Uh, announced that. Yeah. Are you not ashamed by that? 
Well, the Home Secretary has announced two routes. Uh, one is the family visa route and the other is uh, the sponsorship route. And I know the Home Office are working very hard to issue visas. You're not ashamed that, that other countries are taking in tens and tens of thousands and we, who have known longer than any of the other countries that this was going to happen and should have been preparing for it, and your department should have been preparing for it, we've only managed to give out 50 visas so far. Well, I can assure you, Chris, that we have been preparing for it. We've been preparing for it since uh, well before the end of last year. That's why we sent our forward deployment teams to locations in Poland, Slovakia, to provide direct support to people why is leaving it only 50, Ukraine. Then? Well, it's really a matter for the Home Secretary exactly how the visa process works. So I suggest no, that you... No, because part of it's done by you, isn't it? Part of it's done by your department. The, 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 um, no, it's not. People have it's to a, come to you. Home. People have to come to your post to be able to get, as they did in Afghanistan, it was exactly the same issue, to get their biometric um, details taken. I believe that's a Home Office responsibility that operates out of our post. It's Home Office personnel. You have to go to your post to speak to Home it's Office, home office so, so, you're, so you're saying it's the Home Office's fault that we've only managed to do 50. How, how, in, how does somebody in Ukraine at the moment get biometric um, details for a visa to, to come to the UK? Would you like to? So I can, I, can, I can give one example on that. I mean, the Foreign Secretary is absolutely right, it's a Home Office responsibility, but of course um, the Foreign Office uh, fully supports that. And to give an example, so only last week we've opened up a sort of a, a, a pop-up visa application centre just on the border of the other side, the other the other side on the Polish border, 25 uh, miles or so from um, across the border on the main road from Lviv. Um, I think we expect uh, we expect the uh, number of appointments there through that should be around sort of 6,000 6, a week. Um, but that, that gives gives one example of the sort of things we're doing. But this is run through oh, the home office. Run through the home, run through the home I, mean, office I think it is important support. to yeah, passing, note that passing, passing the buck really doesn't work as a as a government minister. It really doesn't. Well, I'm you're, you're suggesting, all part of the same government. I'm suggesting, absolutely, but this is the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Yes, and you're, you're here as the only person speaking for the government. Well, I don't understand. I mean, some of us were arguing for a very long time that we should have been condemning Nord Stream 2 and getting it closed down. The British government pointedly refused to do that mm -hmm. until remarkably recently. So it does well, feel as I, if you've been I playing catch-up. I argued catch -up. for that in November last year, Chris. Yeah, November. Some of us have been Wait. saying this for 10 years. And the, and the British government kept on refusing to say it. So this is why some of us are a bit sceptical about this, oh, we've been leading the world. And when you get to a situation where the well, UK is you only... ask the people of Ukraine, who do see the UK we, we as the, well, leading, the leading supporter of Ukraine, who've been proactive in terms of supplying defensive weapons, proactive in terms of economic support, and proactive to, in terms of calling okay. Russia out. And both the Prime Minister and I said that Nord Stream 2 should be stopped in November last very, year. Very, very late in the day. But let me go back to the issue about visas. And what are the opening hours of um, both the place that you, uh, the post that you've just referred to and, and any other facilities? Are they open at the weekend during the, in, since the invasion? I don't know the opening hours, I'm afraid. I mean, this I'm is, sure this is I, I said, run by the Home Office. It's a Home Office matter. And of course, we work closely with the Home Office this is a cross-government effort. We, we have posts still in Ukraine, don't we? We don't. Our ambassador has left no. Ukraine because of the serious security situation. But you don't know when people can go to, a, to the UK, but you don't know whether it's open at the weekend. You have no my, idea. My understanding of the main way that people apply through the visa routes, I mean, I believe it's open continuously, but it is a... It is a service run by the Home Office in, in, in situ. Sure. I, I, if I may add, I know the Home Office have also surged resource into all the other areas, uh, the neighbouring states, which might also be taking um, by having applicants uh, from, from Ukraine. But I say the nearest one to Ukraine is the one just across the border in Poland. My understanding is that none of them are open after five o'clock on a flight Friday afternoon. So in, at a time of international crisis, it just seems a bit of a, an own goal. And it feels like the UK has been, you, you see people in Berlin railway station standing there, um, you know, offering their home to six, seven, eight Ukrainian refugees. And, and Britain didn't even have a, anything up in up a, a new scheme in place. We've, we've had people, as I've said, forward deployment teams in Poland, in Slovakia for the last few weeks. 
helping with the humanitarian effort, helping get three people through the border. And the Home Office have set up the new visa routes, which they are administering. They've also got um, online services. Yeah, I'm sure that the home, I'm could ask the Home Secretary, I'm sure we can get back to you with the opening hours. Just on um, other refugees, because obviously we were interested in Afghanistan as well last year, and, and there, as I understand it, there are still 12,000 Afghans who have been um, brought to the UK, They've, but they're still in temporary accommodation. What plans are there for Ukrainians when they come here? Will they be following, will they just be in a queue behind <coughs> the Afghans who are still waiting for accommodation, or, or is there not a plan in place? Well, I know this is, the, this is what the Home Office is working on. But you don't know? No. Okay. Stuart. Thank you, Chair. Um, Foreign Secretary, can I take you back to the points you've made on the European security architecture? The government mm. released over the weekend its six-point plan for dealing with Ukraine and always worries me when governments talk in those terms. It sounds a bit like a Lib Dem by-election leaflet. <laughs> um, but can I press you on three of the points of the six-point plan? The final three, um, to prevent the creeping normalisation of Putin's behaviour, to pursue a diplomatic path to de-escalate, and then the last one caught my eye, it says, begin a rapid campaign to strengthen security and resilience in the Euro-Atlantic area. How do you plan to do that, and does it involve revisiting the fundamentals of the integrated review, which many of us now think needs to happen, and happen quickly? This is what one of the issues we were discussing at NATO, NATO foreign ministers on Friday, because the, the threat to European security is much graver now than it was. That's a statement of the obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to strengthen support to the eastern flank. You know, we've already doubled our deployment to Estonia. Others are doing more. Uh, we're increasing our maritime support. We're increasing our... Uh, our air cover and the discussion we had at NATO was about how can we increase that but also how does NATO uh, pursue uh, greater technological reach in terms of hybrid warfare, challenging misinformation, uh, how do we ensure that there are enough resources behind NATO, it's the point that are being made about defence spending but there is a recognition that we need to shift up a gear. Spending is always are, easy to call for, isn't it? Let's be honest. But strategy is what I'm trying to get at here. So there's NATO. You're right to talk about that. There needs to be more, more deployment, yep. particularly more deployment and the on Jeff the Eastern flank. And the Jeff countries doing more. But can I ask, in, in terms of the integrated review, one of the things that many of us said at that time when that was published was that the UK government should pursue a comprehensive defence and security treaty with the European Union. It hasn't done that. Do you think it should now? Well, I attended the uh, European Union Foreign Affairs Committee alongside the Canadians and the Americans and the NATO Secretary General. And throughout this crisis, the NATO, NATO has been working very closely with the EU. Uh, the EU will be attending uh, the next NATO meeting and I support that close working continuing. You know, that, that's we not have to the be, question I'm asking, though. Well, uh, I'm I asking think, about the UK government having a comprehensive defence and security treaty with the European Union. Well, I mean, if your six-point plan well, is going I'm to become talking, real, what, what does I'm, it look like? What, what I'm talking about is much closer working between the EU, uh, with NATO, and with broader allies, as well as us strengthening our additional relationships. So whether that's a relationship with the JEF countries, yeah. uh, whether that's a relationship directly with the EU... We need to strengthen all of that security architecture. So is a, a comprehensive treaty of the kind I'm, I'm not talking about on the table? Is that part of the conversation at all? I would say the key part of the conversation is between the EU and NATO. I think that is the important <clears> way <throat> in which this is being done. And we're, we're seeing very rapid changes across the EU. I've talked about Germany's changes yep. uh, to its defence policy. We're seeing very rapid changes. But, but my view is the West has to be united. We all have to work together. As we, this has been a, a sudden change, which has shaken you know, the whole security architecture of the West. We will need over the coming months to make sure 
that we have a strengthened architecture in place for the future. And the UK is an absolute core part of that. As the largest defence spender in Europe, we are surely, a core part of making that happen. a comprehensive treaty of the but kind I wouldn't, I wouldn't about jump would ahead sense. to exactly what the structures would look like. Mm. What I'm talking about is the concept, which is countries spending more on defence, having a more <coughs> deployment, particularly on the eastern flank, and making sure that we are more closely aligned uh, between all of the partners involved, including those who are not members of NATO. The forthcoming strategic concept at NATO, how do you plan to feed into that? Well, at the uh, NATO foreign ministers meeting in Riga, I talked about the need for us to address technology developments, so quantum, AI, disinformation. I think that the UK and the US have done a lot on exposing intelligence and calling out the Russian playbook, but I think there is more we need to do. The Russians have been effective over the last 20 years in the information, in the information wars, including with their own public, who have not been told the truth about what is happening. So I think NATO uh, needs to do more work on that front. And I think we need more hardware deployment as well. This, this is a wake-up call, and NATO does need to do more, and that's recognised uh, by the Secretary General and all of the members of NATO. And just to take you on to another area, the, the International Court of Justice uh, is currently considering Ukraine's case against Russia. Can I ask if the court does order Russia to, to, to suspend its military activities in Ukraine as a provisional measure, what consequences this would have, and is there any way to enforce? We were a key part of referring uh, the atrocities in Ukraine to the ICC. Uh, you've seen, I think it's the largest group referral to the ICC in its history, and we will continue to pursue uh, the Putin regime being held to account. I, mean, I, can't, I can't speculate about what will happen next, but we are very clear that there are serious questions to answer by Russia on what, on what they have been, you know, the appalling uh, active invasion into Ukraine. In terms of the atrocities that are being, uh, that we're seeing happening in Ukraine by Russia, in your sanctions packages, are you pursuing those around the world who are a party to that, whether that's state or non-state actors around the world, uh, without whom Russia wouldn't be able to commit some of the atrocities that we're seeing? We are able to target anybody of strategic or economic interest to the Russian government. So certainly we're looking at all options. Thank you, Chair. May I just, I'll come to you in just a second. May I just pick up on this ICJ question, or rather International Criminal Court question? Do you believe that the invasion of Ukraine is a crime against peace? I believe it's an illegal invasion. I'm quite specific about the terms I'm using. Do you believe that it is a war of aggression? Well, that's a matter for the ICC. Well, it's but I believe it's, it's not an a matter, illegal. No, quite I believe it's, it's an illegal invasion. Okay, it's it's quite specifically not a matter for the ICC because under treaty the ICC doesn't have the jurisdiction over that. It is, however, a matter for Russian Criminal Code Article 353. It is also a matter that was adjudicated in Nuremberg in the Tokyo trials in 1946-1947. Do you believe that the invasion of Ukraine by Russia is a war of aggression? I know. Well, it's certainly an aggressive act. I'll need to look into the specific legalities of what you mentioned. The reason it matters is because the ICC specifically does not have the capability or the capacity to investigate wars of aggression. It's not charged with it, it doesn't have it within its treaty, and therefore it can't do it. Do you believe a new international tribunal should be set up to look into whether or not this is a war of aggression, to collect evidence of it being so, and perhaps to charge, as was you done before, those who began this war with the criminal conspiracy of beginning a war of aggression? We think the best route to hold Putin to account for what he's done is through the ICC, but I'm certainly willing to look at other routes.
The ICC clearly doesn't have this. No, I hear what you say, but I'm certainly willing to consider other routes. You're willing to consider supporting an international tribunal that people like Philippe Sands um, and the chairs of, I think it's now over a dozen foreign affairs committees, have called for? I'm willing to look at it, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Foreign Secretary. I just wanted to come back a bit to what um, Stuart was talking about and what you said in response and had said earlier on about the, um, the defence infrastructure of the West being shattered by Russia and its act of aggression and that we have not done enough to prevent these, this invasion. And I, I, I just wonder what, what you mean exactly by that, because the armchair generals in my constituency, for example, I think they all know what we should have done in the past and what we should do in the future. Um, it just so happens that they've all got a different view on what we should have done in the past and what we should do in the future. But shattering the defence architecture of the West is, a, is quite some term. And are we suggesting that the West has been so weak that Putin feels that we couldn't deter any act of aggression? And if that's the case, what do you envisage we should do to prevent that in the future? Because as I understand it, when you have NATO and all of the combined might and resource of NATO, if we were talking about a military conflict, which we really hope doesn't come to it and we can prevent any more in Ukraine, that, that we are not, we're not impotent. We couldn't defend ourselves. And yet, shattering the defence architecture of the West sounds like quite a statement. Well, first of all, I think we have to be clear about who's at fault. Putin is the perpetrator and the aggressor here. And I think some of the commentary almost blames the West for what's happened. I don't, I don't accord with that. Putin has made a strategic mistake. He didn't understand how hard the Ukrainians would fight. And he didn't understand the level of unity and the severe sanctions that would come from the West. I think that's an important point to make. But there has been a certain amount of complacency following the ending of the Cold War, uh, the so-called end of history, that you know, we were living in a safe, secure neighbourhood. We didn't really have to worry that you know, Russia had become a free market democracy and everything was fine. And our defence spending, and I mean across the wider West, our posture uh, with respect to economic dependency, so becoming more dependent on Russia for oil and gas, you know, ignored the, the bad possibilities that could happen. And I think it was a certain amount of turning a blind eye to what happened in Crimea, uh, what happened in the Donbass region. And we're, we're now at a stage where the failure to act more decisively earlier has meant that we now face a greater cost in acting now. But my point would be the cost in the future would be even higher. This is why we need to do everything we can to impose as tough sanctions as possible, to get as much defensive support into Ukraine as possible, to give as much support to the Ukrainian government as possible uh, in order to stop Putin in Ukraine, which is our uh, agreed objective. Understood. Andrew Yord. Uh, yes, Mr Chairman, uh, going back to Stuart's question earlier and building on what I said <clears throat> in my question to begin with, surely the last thing we should be doing at this stage is to start signing new treaties with the European Union. What we should be doing is saying to the EU countries that they should be collaborating with us through NATO. So it should be the other way around. Those countries within the EU that are not in NATO should be joining NATO and contributing through the NATO system rather than allowing the EU to become a separate security and defence organisation. In no ways. Well, NATO is clearly extremely important and is the guarantor of security for all its members and we have a very strong ironclad commitment to Article 5. We're seeing various countries that are members of the European Union step up their defence efforts. It, frankly, it's a matter for countries how they want to step up their defence efforts. We're not a member of the European Union. We don't make those decisions for them. What I think is important is, regardless of whether countries are members of the European or not, we've all got a common interest in European security. 
And what is absolutely vital is that we work together on that and are not divided on that. That is why, alongside the Americans and Canadians, I attended the European Union Foreign Affairs Committee. It's why I also attended the NATO foreign ministers meeting. I am prepared to work with any country, any organisation that stands up for freedom and democracy and sovereignty. And we, we, we have to be relentless in our pursuit of, you know, there are two things that deter aggressors. You know, one is hard security. And you know, we've talked about more deployment on the eastern flank. Uh, we've talked about the need to invest in higher tech weaponry. Uh, we've talked about you know, cyber information warfare. And the other thing is cutting off the supply of, you know, of um, finance to, to these rogue states you know, and not becoming economically dependent on countries that have expansionist authoritarian uh, attitudes and desires. That, that is ultimately what is going to protect us and we have to focus a lot more on the what we want to do rather than the specific format. I'm a huge supporter of NATO. I think it has brought peace over generations, but we, we do need to modernise it. It does, it does need to step up. So I, I agree with everything uh, you said, Foreign Secretary, but it was being implied earlier that because we haven't agreed a comprehensive agreement with the European Union, we're somehow at fault. And in fact, other countries in the European Union could have a long time ago participated in, in NATO and supported a strengthening NATO, which we all support. So it's not really our fault that we're not part of this comprehensive agreement. And frankly, we've got better things to do. We should be strengthening NATO and building up more of a global alliance rather than giving the EU a greater role when we all know that when it chips are down, the EU always left wanting when tough action needs to be taken. And it's always the United States and the United Kingdom and particularly the Anglo-Saxon countries that are always there to defend freedom when it's needed. And of course, Germany, Foreign Secretary, has, you'll notice, have changed their policy, but about time too. They have not been contributing for a very long time. And isn't it time the rest of Europe did the same? Someone's had their Weetabix. I, <laughs> Andrew, I completely agree that the UK has shown leadership on this and this has been recognized by the ukrainian people oh, and we've seen others follow our approach of supplying defensive weaponry of supporting the ukrainians of training uh, their army of increasing our deployments into the eastern flank but i do want to praise germany for their change in stand because that will have a huge impact and i want to see others follow their lead and i also praise the EU for moving quickly on sanctions and working with the United Kingdom, working with the United States, working with Canada and Japan to do that. And the EU were present at the G7 meeting in December. Uh, I, I had a one-to-one -one with Joseph Burrell. We agreed on the severe package of sanctions. He has done, done a lot to push it within the EU. So I am not precious about which organisation is pushing these measures whether it's economic sanctions or supplying defensive weaponry, what I care about is whether it gets done. But I'm immensely proud that the UK has taken the lead in speaking out, whether it's on Nord Stream 2, whether it's on sanctions, we're now pushing for a full SWIFT ban, uh, we're pushing for a full bank asset freeze, uh, we're pushing for the next stage of sanctions, but we are working with our partners because what Vladimir Putin wants is he wants a divided West. He wants us arguing amongst ourselves about mm. Treaty X or Treaty Y. Mm. He doesn't want to see unity. Mm. And I think that, has, that is the biggest thing that has shocked Russia, that we are prepared to work with each other, and that is more important to us. Well, f final point of clarification, Foreign Secretary. Is it therefore, if it's unity we want, is it therefore the British government's policy to encourage the remaining EU countries that are not in NATO to join NATO as soon as possible? Yeah. I would like to see NATO strengthened in every possible way. And I certainly don't think it's a matter for Russia or China to decide who is in NATO. Yeah. But the fact is that we 
need to make sure, and there are 30 members of NATO, we need to make sure that you know, all members have to have a say in who, who is able to join NATO, and we need to be able to follow through on the commitment to Article 5 for those countries that join NATO. But, Andrew, I completely agree with you. NATO needs to be strengthened, and that is what we are working to achieve with our, with our friends and allies. Can I just move on before and just say, uh, put on record praise for the Estonian government who are now buying 60 F-35s. That's more than we've got. The Latvian government who uh, are increasing their defence spending to 2.5%. The Lithuanians who are doing the same. Germany's increase is, I think I'm right in saying, about 150% of our total budget. So uh, in total that makes it about three or four times our full uh, defence budget. That's a hell of a change from Ostpolitik. Bob Billigan. Um, a few questions on sort of related themes, if I may. The, the economic crime bill today, there's been some kind of bill promised since 2018. I'd love to know your opinion of, of the delay and why it has been so delayed for so long and it's taken a major war to finally bring it in. And is this the end of a process and the government's going to pat itself on the back or is it the beginning of a process where, for example, we might bring an updated Espionage Act, a, a foreign lobbying, a foreign agent registration act, reform of libel and data protection rules, um, more rules to tighten the use of harassment suits uh, against uh, journalists, campaigners and the like. Why have we been slow and is this the end of a process or the start of a process? Well, the answer is that this is not the end of the process, that we are determined to crack down on all of the practices uh, that you talk about. In terms of the specific amendments that we're bringing uh, to the Economic Crime Bill, uh, we have uh, previously uh, been unable to bring these measures in, but we do think, uh, down to the severity of this crisis and the political impetus around it, we are now able to get those changes through. Okay. It's, 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 it is quite concerning that it's taking a very long time to sanction these bad actors uh, the, the oligarchs close to Putin. Why have we done that when, as Chris Bryant suggested, we could just read out the names and the reasons on the floor of the House and use privilege? I do, I do think it's important to go back to what happened around the sanctions and anti-money laundering bill in 2018. So the government faced a number of amendments which made it harder uh, to get sanctions uh, agreed and made it cumbersome and slower. So in particular, uh, the bill went through with no limits to damages available to sanctioned individuals and entities. So in 2019, we had a case where the Treasury had to pay out $100 million of public money. And the problem with that is, it inherently makes the government more risk averse if they're potentially facing huge damages. Secondly, uh, it was required there was an impact test against the Human Rights Act. And there was also the addition of an appropriateness test, including the requirement to consider significant effects of sanctions. So all of these amendments to the bill mm. has made it harder for us to get through sanctions designation. It's taken longer for our lawyers to gather the evidence compared to international comparators like Canada or the United States or even the EU. And the reason that that is the case is that there was a group of people in the House of Lords supported, it has to be said, by opposition parties in the House of Commons who pushed for those amendments. So we had Lord Panic and Lord Judge push for a more rigorous process for imposing sanctions and particularly push for the inclusion of the appropriateness test. Uh, Lord, Lord Panic welcomed Amendment 9 to the bill, saying it was satisfied it would impose a real discipline on ministers uh, putting stuff through. Yes. Uh, and I think this is important. Annalise Dodds, when the third reading of this bill went through, said that the bill gave ministers excessive power which could not be justified by the need for speed. So even after all these amendments have been added in the House of Lords, the Labour Party was still saying that the process was too fast. And she called for additional bureaucracy through a cross-Whitehall committee to scrutinise sanctions. So what we had was a group of lawyers and peers in the House of Lords who pushed for more cumbersome amendments, 
that really put a very high bar on our lawyers being able to look at this stuff, which was supported by the Labour Party in the House of Commons. I think Chris Bryant warmly welcomed the amendments to the bill during the third reading. So we have a very cumbersome sanctions process because all of those amendments were added. We're now in a position, because of the severity of the situation, where we are in a position to get rid of a lot of those amendments that were put on the bill. So this is what we're doing. Uh, we're removing the appropriateness test. We're capping the damages on judicial review. And this will enable us to rapidly sanction anybody sanctioned by our allies. So the economic crime bill uh, is introduced today. If Parliament passes the legislation by Monday the 14th of March, we will be able to sanction the hundreds of individuals by next Tuesday, the 15th of March. But we are only able to do that because we now have the political will to get this bill through without those amendments. It's a shame it is still being so delayed, but let's, let's just move but on. It's, yeah. we, we started acting before Christmas. We tripled the size of our sanctions team. We brought forward secondary legislation, so we brought through on the 10th of February. Uh, we broadened our designation criteria. On the 28th of February, we brought action against banks and critical industries. On the 1st of March, we laid two further SIs on the central bank and the port entry ban. But my point is, Bob, that the sanctions legislation had been added to hugely in the House of Lords, making it more cumbersome. And we needed to have confidence that if we introduced primary legislation, it wouldn't just be blocked by the House of Lords. That is the issue. Okay. So today, right. the... And so we've, I mean, we brought this legislation forward as soon as we could. Oh, you know, so it's pretty soon after... We so to date, the, the EU has been more nimble on sanctions than the UK, is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is that the legislation in the EU and Canada and the US is less onerous than our legislation because we didn't have... This was put through in 2018 when we were in a minority government and lots of extra clauses were added by Lord Panic. You know, I, and you know, others sorry, in the House you, of Lords supported me, by the Labour Party. You, you, I mean, that's the, that's the reality of the absolutely. situation. Absolutely. I've heard you very clearly. I'm sure others have heard you very clearly as well. Can I just ask a couple more questions on a different subject? But I'd like to get them in. No, and not on a different subject now. We're going to bring in others and then come back to you if you're going on to something else. Because the, the question about sanctions uh, of others, the, the Duma is clearly... Uh, the Duma sanctions are clearly an element that has been covered by the EU. Are we going to do that, or is that something that we can't do at the moment? Uh, we have said we'll do that, absolutely. Can, I just want to make a broader point, Chairman, which is what is the purpose of the sanctions? The purpose of the sanctions is to debilitate the Russian economy, so that Vladimir Putin doesn't have the money to fund his war machine. And if you look at the overall picture of what we've done relative to what the EU and the US have done, so on banks, We've sanctioned 259 billion worth of banks compared to the US on 240 billion and the EU on 34 billion. You... On defence, we've sanctioned 35 billion worth. The US have sanctioned 10 billion worth. The EU haven't done any defence sanctions. The only thing that concerns me about all of this is we called out uh, dirty Russian money in 2018 in our Moscow's Gold Report. And this just suggests to me that that money has been swishing around quite happily for the last four years and maybe even collecting a bit more while other countries may have been doing something to get rid of it. Is that true or is it just completely by chance that we've had a lot more money and therefore we've been able to do something about the, it? The point I've made is that the way we have done our, san our sanctions work since this crisis emerged we have hit more of the Russian economy no, I, I than either that, but the... But it's, it's an important point. Is that because point. more of it's sitting in London, though? No. No, it's because we have targeted banks that the EU and the US haven't. We've targeted defence companies that the EU and the US haven't. So in total, we've targeted $364 billion, the US have targeted $340 billion, and the EU have targeted $124 billion. Now, I have said there's a specific issue on individuals, because of the cumbersome amendments put on the sanctions legislation in 2018, included being supported by Chris Bryant at the time. 
And you're on the record, Chris, for yeah, supporting just not, but it, but those I didn't amendments. say I supported the amendments to introduce the Magnitsky sanctions. I was one of the people who'd been arguing for them for many, many years. What you've just read out is not in Hansard. So I hope you'll correct the record. I didn't speak in the third, third reading debate. Well, we can. I've been I've told you here. did, so I can. Uh, Helen Goodman, get Sir Alan details. Duncan, Joe Swinson, Sir Alan Duncan. I didn't speak in the third reading debate. I'll get my officials to check up on that. Mark Francois, Nigel Evans. Ariel. Okay. Can I just add one other principal point here? I get the fact that you're going after Race. major institutions, but do you accept that there are two forms of Russian foreign policy? There is the official state policy and the banks that you're going after, but also do you accept the way that oligarchs have been used informally by the Kremlin, turning economic power into political power, and they are significant players and part of the Russian regime in their own right. And specifically in this country, one of the most important roles has been to channel vast sums of money to tax havens, which they've done very successfully, guarded by the financial institutions and the lawyers who have affected, protected, who have effectively protected that caravan of vast sums of money that's been flowing from Moscow via London to those tax havens. And therefore, these oligarchs, the kleptocrats, are implicitly part of the informal Russian state. Does the government accept that? Because it talks about understanding hybrid war. And I sometimes I wonder if it actually understands so, the reality of hybrid so tools. I do, I do accept that we need to sanction these oligarchs who are supportive of the Putin regime. And I want to do that, and I want to do that as quickly as possible. What I'm saying to you is there are impediments in place because of the way the legislation was passed in 2018. And it's only since we've had confirmation, and by the way, we haven't had confirmation from the, the House of Lords that they will pass the Economic Crime Bill. But I'm assuming that given the severity of the situation, they will. It's only because we're in this situation now that we are able to pass this primary legislation. I suspect if we tried to do that a few months ago, we would not have got it through. And we certainly faced a situation in 2018 where we had these cumbersome amendments added that made our position worse than those in, those in comparable countries. But what, what I would also say, Bob, is that we shouldn't overestimate the influence of the oligarchs in Russia. The fact is that Putin has operated in a fairly narrow circle, deciding on this war and to go forward with this war. He has ignored repeated warnings uh, from, from others on the cost to Russia. And this is why I believe the main purpose of the sanctions is to debilitate the Russian economy. And that is why our number one uh, objective has been to take out the financial services sector, to target the defence sector, because we think that is where the maximum impact is going to be, rather than just focusing on the oligarchs. I'm not saying the oligarchs aren't important. I'm not, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and sanction all the oligarchs on my list tomorrow, I would do it. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is the legislation we're now introducing will allow us to do that next week. It's the first of other bills, including tightening up other procedures and a new Espionage Act and a new Lobbying Act that you're also going to be looking at and supporting, I hope, Foreign Minister. Yes, although you'll be aware that those are, those are under the auspices of other government departments, but we're certainly looking at all those things. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm going to come to Alicia and then Henry. I'm fab, thank you, Chair. Um, you mentioned there the atrocities that we're seeing on the ground. You mentioned there that we were seeing atrocities on the ground. I think we've all been horrified by the images we're starting to see. But I think the lessons of Syria is that there is evidently much worse to come. Um, what is our plan to prevent atrocities in the next coming days, the next 48 hours? And what red lines or repercussions are there for the continued use of cluster bombs, for thermobaric weapons, and ultimately that we have to plan for chemical weapons and what our response will be to those? Well, I fear that you are absolutely correct in assessing that because the plan is not going according to what Vladimir Putin had set out, that we are, we are likely to see worse and worse uh, ammunition being used uh, and techniques. I mean, we saw the reckless attack on a nuclear, a <coughs> nuclear power plant. We are seeing the use of cluster weapons, uh, we are likely to see a very, very serious attack on Kiev. 
and that is extremely, extremely concerning. And we are calling it out. We've already asked the ICC to investigate uh, the potential that war crimes have been committed. Uh, we're doing all we can to accelerate uh, the provision of a humanitarian corridor, but we are you know, we're looking at a barbaric, a barbaric prosecution of war by a a, a dictator, and that that is unfortunately uh, the position we're in. And I think we need to be prepared for this to draw out longer term. A lot of these economic sanctions I've talked about only work over time. I think, though, that what, what we have seen is the Ukrainians are prepared to fight and that even if there is success in taking the cities, uh, even if there is success of Russia being, a, uh, being able to occupy some or broader parts of Ukraine, the Ukrainian people are not going to give up. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, this will be a failure for Putin. But what is so horrific is this failure is going to end in so much tragedy. And not just the appalling tragedy that we're seeing visited on the Ukrainian people, the appalling tragedy for the Russian soldiers who've been sent in. And, you know, the reports of thousands of soldiers already have been killed. And this, you know, this will hit the Russian population as well. And the difficulty is no, no amount of heroism uh, survives in the face of chemical weapons use, orthobarics or any of the others. Um, have we yet put in place post-chemical weapon exposure plans so we can make sure we can send in that appropriate aid? But also, will we consider, and I, I recognise it's unlikely to be able to confirm this today in a public setting, but meaningful repercussions, cyber strikes at the heart of Russian critical national infrastructure uh, that are fully deniable or actions such as that, because Putin's already declared that he sees us arming the Ukrainians as an act of war, that our sanctions are in essence. We cannot allow the Ukrainian people's bravery to be the <coughs> stalwart against such weapons use. There have to be repercussions. There will be repercussions. And you know, there's been a referral already uh, to the International Criminal Court and you know it's being investigated and there are already uh, numerous atrocities that have been committed that are being investigated. Of course uh, we're doing all we can to support the Ukrainians. I'm working very very closely with the Ministry of Defence and the Ukrainian government. In fact on the day of the invasion uh, Ben Wallace and I had a call with our counterparts to coordinate how we support Ukraine, and we're working through NATO with our international allies on this. I think, I think my, my, question, my ask, desperate ask, would be that we know that no amount of threatening of legal action is going to stop him, uh, so there must be some sort of agreement behind the scenes, secretive, whatever it needs to be, deniable, fully deniable, um, or actions should we see continued atrocities, particularly those nature. Um, this takes me to a wider point, which is, for a long time I've talked about atrocity prevention with the Foreign Office not being what it should be. Uh, we've only just stood up the conflict centre, which took many months of lobbying for. Or do we have an atrocity prevention? Is it time for an atrocity prevention strategy across the whole of the Foreign Office, but also for every single post to have one, a framework that they can apply within their own post? Because otherwise we're not going to see the sort of atrocity prevention flagging early enough. We're not going to know exactly what sort of preventative and reactionary measures actually stop atrocities from going further and further and further. And this is something meaningful that Global Britain could do, which is a lead on atrocity prevention around the world, but it needs an institutional change within the heart of the department. I agree with your point on atrocity prevention. What we are facing in Ukraine is, you know, a dictator who whose invasion plan hasn't worked. It hasn't been as fast as he would hope to take the cities and he is turning to more and more extreme measures. And whilst we're doing all we can to support with defensive weaponry, with humanitarian support, including uh, some of the issues you've covered, Alicia, you know, we are not in a position where NATO is getting directly involved. That, that is the stark reality of the, of the situation we're in. And it's appalling, it's unconscionable. But we have seen Putin prepared to use those types of weapons in other countries. That is the horrific reality of the situation 
uh, the we're dealing with. Would be, however, and I apologise, Chair, this is my last point in this question. The fact is, the Foreign Office is not set up in any way to have a framework. So, it, essentially, when I worked on the Syria Destiny Iraq Destiny Counterterrorism Test, you were expected to suddenly become an expert in atrocity prevention when we were already so far down the line of recognising atrocities were, were in place that there was no meaningful way to stop them, to limit the bloodshed, to make, take action. We could meaningfully have, and this happens, you know, Ukraine, Xinjiang, Burma, Syria, you name it. If the Foreign Office was to use its conflict centre to create a framework and to have framework for atrocity prevention, where every post has to have an atrocity prevention strategy, where we have a core set of expertise, be it sanctions, counter disinformation, military, humanitarian, so on and so on, a core set of resources set in the centre of the department, we would see earlier flagging of atrocities. We would see desks not struggling to suddenly become experts in atrocity prevention, but being able to pull on a central resource. And we would end up with earlier flagging of potential atrocities and earlier stopping. I mean, I think we have been flagging atrocities pretty assiduously during this campaign and collecting evidence. The issue is that Putin is pursuing these. But this isn't with, about Ukraine. This is about yeah. long term, how we fundamentally mm. change the Foreign Office is internal approach to atrocities because it has been failing time and time again mm. because we do not have the expertise or the resources or the frameworks in place to support people. It's not. An, it's too late for Ukraine. Mm. But what we could do is look at other, in now preparing posts to be able to support for future atrocity prevention. It's certainly something I'm, I'll look at. Thank you. you want to I, might, I, can, I can add something more, if I may, on sort of the afterwards, you, because you, um, you spoke earlier about uh, accountability as well for atrocities. And we spoke clearly about the ICC, and you asked also about um, crime of uh, aggression tribunals. I should also mention, linked to that, you know, the human right, UN Human Rights Council, where you know, so it was last week voted 32-2 to have a commission of inquiry. The other area is the, um, is the OSCE where we joined 44 other states uh, and Ukraine to launch a mission into violations of, of human rights. So just, yeah, I thought I'd get the wider package out there as well. Thank you. Can I just come back to this point about atrocities that you've highlighted, Foreign Secretary? You voted in 2011 to intervene in Libya because of the atrocities being committed there, and you voted to intervene in Syria in 2013 because of the, so. the atrocities being committed there. What's different in Ukraine? We are doing all we can to support the Ukrainians in their valiant self-defense of Ukraine. There is no prospect, as the Defense Secretary has been clear, of NATO troops going in to Ukraine. That, that is the difference. But just to be clear, the difference is the unwillingness of allies to cooperate. Otherwise, you would support it. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we don't support it. And the, the no, it's just a straight question. What's the difference between intervening in Libya in 2011, intervening in Syria in 2013, and intervening in Ukraine in 2022? All of them have got mass human rights violations. You've already told us that there are atrocities being committed. You've already told us you're referring to the Russian government. There isn't. I mean, the there is government. a not. Sorry, may I finish? You're already telling us that you're referring the Russian government to the International Criminal Court because of war crimes. What is the substantive difference for your different approach to these different countries? We don't want a situation where NATO is at war with Russia. Okay. That is the difference. Thank you. Makes it clear. Henry. Uh, Mr Chairman, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Foreign Secretary, uh, thank you for being with us today. If I could take us slightly back uh, to talk of sanctions, of course, uh, Russia's aggression uh, and the Putin regime um, war on Ukraine uh, has been the uh, main focus of sanctions, both from the UK uh, and uh, our allies, and indeed uh, we will be developing that uh, further. But of course, uh, Belarus has been involved um, in uh, supporting uh, Putin. Um, Lukashenko has been um, the current useful lackey uh, of uh, Putin um, in terms of uh, allowing troops to train on his soil. In recent days, of course, we have seen a a slight um, uh, retrenchment on that position from Minsk, um, being uh, a little bit uh, concerned uh, about their uh, involvement, not that I think we can trust what's coming out of the regime uh, in Minsk. Uh, can you say a little bit more about what action the United Kingdom and its allies is looking to take against uh, the uh, Lukashenko regime uh, in uh, Belarus? and? Um, how um, we are looking to mitigate against uh, that sort of um, support uh, that uh, the country is seeking to uh, provide the Kremlin. 
You're right that uh, Belarus has been aiding and abetting the Putin invasion of Ukraine, and we will be applying. We've already got sanctions on Belarus. We'll be applying more sanctions, and the measures in the Economic Crime Bill will help us do that quicker. And uh, so, so there are specifically further targeted sanctions that are being worked on right now against Belarus. Yes. If I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, talking about other countries uh, in the region, uh, this time not necessarily in terms of sanctions, but in terms of the threat posed to them uh, by uh, the Putin regime um, in Russia. Uh, Moldova um, is a country uh, that is uh, neutral um, and also has a part of its territory, tra Transnistria, uh, that is effectively partially occupied by uh, Russian troops. Um, what support is being provided towards uh, Moldova, Moldova? And um, it's been said that uh, you know many people's COVID lockdown projects was to uh, learn to play an instrument or, 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 or to cook better. And uh, for Putin, it was going through the Kremlin archives and um, seeing how he could recreate uh, Russian imperialism. What kind of threats um, do we see towards uh, countries like Moldova and indeed others um, if Putin isn't stopped uh, with regard to his action in Ukraine? Well, I fear that it wasn't a COVID project by Putin. I mean, he openly made his comments about the desire to restore wider Russia in his 2007 Munich Security Conference speech. So this has been on the cards for some time and it's been a long held ambition and frankly, the West should have taken it more seriously uh, long, long before. I agree with your analysis on Moldova and it is very concerning what's happening in Transnistria uh, and the, the threat uh, that we're seeing on the Moldovan border. Uh, the UK has sent uh, humanitarian teams to support Moldova and we're looking at what more we can do as are our allies across NATO but it, it is a serious concern and you know we're seeing that also uh, with Kaliningrad and and the threat there to the Baltic states it, this invasion of Ukraine is of course an absolutely appalling uh, appalling in itself, but there are also wider security security concerns and fairly immediate security concerns as well, including Moldova. Thanks very much. Graham, you wanted to come in. Yeah, if, if I may take you uh, back, Foreign Secretary, uh, to a couple of answers you gave earlier, and you've been admirably candid, really, about uh, what's happened over the last 20 years particularly about, if not dependence, the integration of the supply of fossil fuels to this country and elsewhere. Uh, the President of the United States has been talking about not purchasing any oil uh, from Russia in the future. Do you think that's a, something you're considering and a real possibility of stopping to purchasing uh, oil and gas from Russia. I know we don't purchase much directly, but there is some. We, we've been very clear that we want to see more action to reduce dependence on Russia, Russian oil, gas and coal. And we're, we're talking about the G7, about having a timetable to do that. I mean, some countries are extremely dependent, particularly on Russian gas, to very high percentages. So we don't just need a timetable, we also need to find alternative supplies for that gas, potentially from the Middle East and other parts of the world, or indeed greater investment in nuclear and renewables to be able to wean off gas. And on the oil proposition uh, you mentioned, Graham, you know, we are looking at, at what we can do on that front, because there's no doubt that we have to cut off the supply of money into the Russian government. And the number one supply of money into the Russian government is hydrocarbons. So that has to be part of the solution. And it is why Putin has been able to fund the, 
the, the war machine, the army, to the extent he's been able to fund them, is because of hydrocarbon revenue. That's ultimately what it comes down to. It doesn't appear to have funded them very well. I mean, the invasion may not be going to according to plan, but it is causing huge devastation. And I fear, I very sincerely fear that we are, we are likely to face worse very soon. It's going to take a long time to do that, but don't you think we should be talking to the major oil gas producers, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, even Venezuela, where there are uh, sanctions on, to ensure uh, that nobody is dependent on uh, Russian gas and oil? And that surely, I mean, are any efforts being made to do that? Because it surely could be done quickly. The, the one of the successes of the response to the crisis so far is we have coordinated across the G7. So we can take unilateral actions as the UK, and we're prepared to take unilater unilateral actions as the UK. But to be effective, we have to make sure that there aren't alternative markets for leakage of Russian oil, gas, coal to go into. So that's why it's more important for us to coordinate at a G7 level and more widely to reduce dependence. We also need to work with countries like South Africa, India to reduce their dependence as well on whether it's Russian defence, Russian oil and gas, or indeed their export markets. Again, Foreign Secretary, you've been very candid about the failures of the West in general to listen carefully to what Putin has been saying uh, for some time about his ambitions to take back what were previously parts of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, there's an article in today's Daily, Mer Daily <coughs> Mail by uh, Dominic Lawson saying that everything was there to be seen and this is a major failure of one particular ambassador, I don't want to name him because he's one of a number. It's a, it's a failure of the Foreign Office and it is not uh, unique that, that the Foreign Office has called people who warned about Putin uh, a Cold War warriors and didn't want to have anything uh, to do with them. But over the last 30 years, of the big changes there have been uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Arab Spring, this uh, war, the dreadful war that started now, the Foreign Office has been off the field of play, really. It's not managed to warn people. Do you think there is something fundamentally wrong uh, in the way that the Foreign Office gathers information and develops policy? Well, in this, in this crisis, we have been at the forefront of warning about what Putin was planning of... Uh, that, that's three, three months, four months, Foreign Secretary. I'm talking about a, a much deeper problem over a longer period of time. <coughs> I, think, I think this problem, which I have talked about during this session, is about the wider, not just the West, but the wider free world in taking its foot off the pedal on abandoning a lot of the infrastructure we had in place during the Cold War and thinking that peace would be eternal and that we could divert money onto other things, we didn't need to spend it on defence, that we didn't need an information unit, that we didn't need the same level of you know, um, focus on these policy areas. I think that wasn't unique to Britain. I think that happened across Europe. I mean, we've been talking about Germany and their approach. I think it happened in the United States as well. I mean, there's a lot of famous comments around the debate in the United States, you know, focus on China, Russia is no longer the threat that we should be worried about, we should be on China. I mean, of course, if we see a weak NATO, that is likely to embolden China. So I see a tough policy on Russia and a tough policy on China as being complementary. And Mr. Chairman, I have now heard from my officials that Mr. Bryan did welcome the bill, but not the amendment. So I want to correct the record uh, on that subject. Thank I'm you. sorry, it was wrong in my notes, um, Mr. Bryant. Uh -huh. I apologise. Thank Can you. I just ask uh, one final I question. Will, uh, I will. It was. It was 
written wrongly by an so I do apologise. Just one final question, if I may, and it's the obverse of uh, the question that Andrew asked you before. You said you wanted uh, NATO to be strengthened, and that's, that, that, that's welcome, and there are obvious countries that could join NATO. I, during the uh, EU debate, I shared a platform with one of your predecessors, David Owen, and he was very clear that one of his major reasons uh, for having changed his view on the European Union and wanted to come out of the EU uh, was that there was a drive within the European Union uh, for a European uh, army, a European force. And he thought that uh, would mean that in any conflict there would be two centres of control. There would be NATO and a European army. And that would be disastrous in any uh, large uh, conflict. So, in welcoming new members of uh, to NATO, wanting people to join NATO, uh, and we're out of the EU, but are you arguing that there shouldn't be a European um, army, basically? I mean, I am reluctant to tell other countries how to run their defence policy. Uh, I think NATO is the best way of organising our collective security in Europe and it's proven itself over time and we now need to strengthen NATO. But we are not a member of the European Union. You know, we decide our defence policy ourselves. We work with all of our like-minded allies, including you know, the GEF countries, including the EU, including the United States, including Australia and you know, AUKUS is an important part of strengthening the global security architecture as well. So we're not a member of the EU. Uh, I don't want to give EU member states advice on how to organise their defence policy. The advice I do give to them is, you know, we need to reduce strategic dependence on Russia and take a much tougher stance. And the fact that we haven't taken a tougher stance has led to the emboldenment of Vladimir Putin. Just let me ask the question a slightly different way. The two major military powers within Europe are ourselves and France. Shouldn't we be arguing strongly with both France and other colleagues in, in NATO to enhance that relationship? The relationship with France since we left the European Union has not been great uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but shouldn't we be trying to enhance that and that is not telling any other country how to follow their defence policy it's just saying it's sensible for the two largest uh, military powers in Europe to work more closely together we, we do work very closely with France and we continue to to build that relationship as we as we see Germany scaling up its defence we will also be working closely with Germany. I think that's important, but I don't see these things as exclusive. You know, the United Kingdom has a multiplicity of defence relationships around the world, and part of what we need to do is you know, be working more closely with the likes of India, Japan. We're, we're, we're um, negotiating a reciprocal access agreement with Japan at the moment, for example. So I think we could, our current status enables us to be very nimble and flexible in the way we, we do things. And it enables us to take a lead, as we did with supplying defensive weapons to Ukraine. And we should continue to use that to impel others to act. I think that is our useful role here. Can I, forgive me, I'm going to come to very quickly to Alicia, who's, who's got to go in a second. So do you want to ask your question very quickly? Thank you. It was just briefly about uh, preventing spillover and distraction uh, mm. efforts on opening a second front in the Western Balkans. And I should declare I'm uh, chair of the APPG for Bosnia, and I'm very grateful for the efforts of raising it at the NATO Ministerial and also Sir Stuart Peach. Um, what planning and efforts are the Foreign Office currently putting in to essentially shore up the stability of Bosnia? Well, you're, you're, you're very correct. It's a major concern. We had a meeting last week uh, with the Prime Ministers of the Western Balkans I and the Prime Minister uh, had those meetings. Uh, we're doing what we can to strengthen the institutional arrangements, including targeting those who are leading successionist movements. Um, but what, what, 
what I would say, it really comes back to the point about economics. The coast has been left relatively clear in the Western Balkans for increased economic involvement by both Russia and China. What we need to do is replace that with British international investment, which we are now rolling out to the Western Balkans, and we need our allies to do more. We need the European Union and the countries within the European Union to also invest more in Western Balkans, as well as, um, as, well as Sir Stuart Peach, obviously the Sh Christian Schmidt, uh, who has an active role as well. So we need to continue to work to strengthen the investment into the region. I think that's one of the most important ways uh, that we can provide a bulwark to increased uh, Russian interference. Because I think the situation in Ukraine, uh, the trauma that Bosnians are currently going through as they see what is happening, it reminds of the mm -hmm. siege of Sarajevo, mm -hmm. which started only not next month, yeah, will be the anniversary of it. When you mention the financials, there is something the UK could do now, which is that Republic of Serbska raised £350 million of London Stock Exchange in 2021. It was the only place in the world that they were able to raise money uh, to finance mm. their debt. Um, is this something you could look at in terms of how we cut off their access to our financial capital? Certainly. And of course, the economic crime bill provisions that we're putting through will enable us to better target uh, the successionists. Uh, in Bosnia, so yes, we are, we are on that. And this, oh this legislation, as well as helping us make sure all the oligarchs are sanctioned uh, in the case of Ukraine, will also help us target Belarus, and they'll also help us target successions in Bosnia as well. And just before I come to you, Mr. Drew, my, my final question about it is that Ukraine obviously demonstrates the consequences of insufficient deterrence. We know that in Bosnia, the Brichko district, which is the key point at which any uh, conflict would be really key, we can place troops legitimately in Brichko mm. district at the request of the federal government. Um, has that been considered? And if not, could I urge you to consider it? And also at the same time for us to rejoin you for, because it is not a European uh, organisation, Turkey is a member, Chile is a member, and to uplift our troops. It's not just a youthful force. I will, I will discuss all of this with the Defence Secretary on Thank our next meeting, which is very soon. Yes. Thank you. And apologies, Mr. Drew. No, not at all. I mean, just hearing hearing you had to go. I have an update on the sort of on the humanitarian carve outs you asked about earlier. Um, there was a meeting actually this morning with the various um, uh, uh, sector, including the ICRC. Um, you know, as I said, you know, we want there to be a carve out. We want the humanitarians to be able to do what they want to do. At the moment, they're telling us that the the the, the broad license. Um, to enable humanitarian assistance that we have in the existing legislation is okay. So we're checking with them as we checked this morning, but actually if that changes, well, we will of course do, do, do what we need to do. Thank you. I don't think they think the CPS is going to come after them. I think they just want that clarity in law that it's completely clear. Great. Thank you. Thanks Thank you, much. Chair. Good. Thank you, Chair. Um, just very quickly, I'm conscious of time. The Russian embassy here in the UK is still at full pelt, hasn't been degraded at all, I think I'm right in saying. Could you just explain why that is? The, the, the issue is, first of all, I think it's helpful to work with our international partners on taking action on diplomats, so I think it's more effective. But secondly, we still have our embassy operation in Moscow, which does provide a way of us communicating uh, with the Russian population, amongst other things. So we just have to be careful that any action we take is in the balance of benefit to the United Kingdom, not in the balance of benefit to Russia. But all of these potential actions 